Servus, hello, happy holidays and happy new year for this final single track episode of the year 2023. I sit down with friend of the show, Alex Bond, to discuss this past year in our little world we call trail running. We chat about the growth our sport has seen and the place it's taking among many of the other outdoor activities. Of course, we highlight the incredible achievements by individual runners from Courtney Dowwater's unfathomable triple to Carol Sabby's Barkley and PCT double. And we wander a lot. What's the economic impact our sport on mountain towns and other host venues? Who gets to call themselves a trail runner? And of course, we wonder about the expansion of UTMB worldwide and if that cool race around Mont Blanc has lost its cool factor. But before we dive in here, I want to take a moment to thank all of you, my dear listeners. Thanks for subscribing, sharing, liking, leaving comments and reviews, and of course, listening to Single Track over this past year and all the years prior. This is episode 292 and the 27th episode for this year. Yeah, in 23, I've gotten a bit inconsistent with my posting schedule. I hope you forgive me. I'm working on that. This coming April, I'll be celebrating the sixth anniversary of Single Track, the podcast that somewhat still keeps on evolving, but always is a perfect outlet for me and my thoughts. I love sharing these conversations with people who I think are important and fascinating and I feel have something unique and valuable to contribute to our world. I hope this has been and continues to be an inspiration for you wherever you listen to Single Track. All right, now let's jump into my conversation with Alex. This is Single Track, and I have Alex Bond back on the horn, and I very much appreciate you coming back on. It's been a while. How are you? I'm doing all right. Actually, it's been kind of a weird, uh, we're recording this in early December. It's been a, oh, an odd last, you know, we get into the the rainy season here and the short days, and so it's sort of in the doldrums of forcing yourself to get outside a little bit but uh you know in general things going just fine and you know getting excited for 2024 and you know, putting stuff on the calendar and thinking about what i want to do and all that sort of stuff so that 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 excitement for the uh for looking towards the future is all is all bubbling along i, I think i say this every year i love my off season i love being sort of a little bit of a you know, two colored chameleon, if you will. And in the summer, I want to spend as much time outside and in the mountains as I can. And then in the winter times, I love baking and doing all kinds of indoor stuff. Sure, I will try to get out, try to get my runs in no matter what, try to sort of stay active and healthy and keep sort of a, a certain level of fitness. But I do like sort of the switching off. And part of the being at home is then sort of the planning and the pouring of ideas and sort of starting a dream phase again of what's what's on the agenda. Yeah, it's easy to uh it's easy to think, oh well, you know, spring and summer is a long ways off. I kind of got in trouble with that last year thinking, oh, you know, it's you know, months and months away. And then all of a sudden you look at the calendar and you realize, oh, actually that uh, race I was thinking about doing is just eight weeks now and I really got to get my act together. And so I think that that's all good and healthy as long as you don't let it sneak up on you too much, because, um, you know, even if your race is 20 weeks away on the calendar, they, I, I found that they, those weeks go away faster than you think. I know it's a, it's a tricky piece. And this is sort of one of the evil things about races that you commit early you can commit to something way before you are in shape or whatever. You put money down, which cre which creates a level of commitment that is more so than this, hey, I want to run this really cool route. I want to do this really, really cool project, right? And then you work your way backwards and the races then become a little bit the priority over everything else. Like I feel like for me, this last year, I spent mostly training very dedicated for specific races in very little time like none following any cool projects like i didn't really get out and do cool adventures you did a whole bunch of cool stuff though yeah it wasn't my best year but i had so i yeah there were a few things along the way I, you know it's just one of those things you have uh you know we all have good years and we all have bad years i was actually i was all generally for most of my life it was a good year this year but i didn't uh you know, we'll see. I'm I'm excited about the prospects for 
getting back and I didn't do any ultras this year. And so I, I've, I have signed up for 50 K in the spring and, you know, excited. I'm thinking about, you know, we'll see what the rest of the year looks like. Nice. Well, you are signed up for Saturnalia, if I'm correct on that. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, this is the absolute um, season highlight for you, right? 10K, <laughs> Olympia, City Park. Yeah, I've been, uh, you know, tra I've been training my butt off for it. You know, we'll sort of see. I haven't actually, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll... actually running 10K all in a row for us trail runners, especially slow trail runners like us, actually running 10K in a row, you don't always do all that often because, you know, oh, here's a hill, I'm going to walk up it kind of a thing. That's our normal way of doing things. So actually, I'm kind of interested to see how it goes. We'll see. I like it. I like it. All right. So part of the reason why the main reason why I wanted to have you on is in the hell, man, two white guys on the podcast doing a year in review recap. I hate <laughs> to call it, this is the state of our sport, but I kind of wanted to do a show like this to say, I think, you know, last time I had you on, we talked about some movie on Netflix, right? So <laughs> let's do something different and try to be a little bit, um, I don't know, more professionally, more journalistic, if you will, right? Um, and, and look at our sport. There's been so much going on this last year and mainly sort of bunched into the la latter half. And um, I don't know, I think for many people, just normal trail runners, it probably flew past them and they might have read a couple headlines here and there, a couple posts, and they took note. But there's been a lot going on in the year. So, I don't know. Should we recap? Should we look at and see what what was important over this this last year in our sport? Yeah, I figure that's that you know, check in on some of the big stories and and uh folks can they can share come up with their own opinions and share them and but yeah, go over some of some of the stuff that happened. One thing that sort of kicks this off for me is that a report came out that's um, in the daily, some government report that uh, spoke to, and we'll link all of these things that we mentioned in the show notes so people want to follow this up in more detail, but that the outdoor industry contributes more than a trillion dollars to the U.S. economy. Um, and I think it speaks to the fact, it speaks to multiple things. Number one is, I think our sort of industry has been, from an e economically speaking, has been under reported, underdocumented. Only recently people have been taking sort of a little bit closer look at um, what is actually happening in this uh, in, in our world and looking at it from an economic driver point of view. So I think the more we see these kind of re reports, well, hopefully this can change politicians' minds and how they allocate public land or permit certain things and think about this because it is such an important aspect of our economy increasingly. Um, but also there's just a general growth, right? I mean, uh -huh. people love going out stores and one trillion isn't all UTMB races. This is <laughs> the larger sector that includes boating and hunting and mountain biking. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, this is Boomtown, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things when you look at it is that the costs of trips and travel are a huge part of what makes up for that. And so I think as now, you know, people are, everybody's forgotten that there even ever was a pandemic. Uh, you know, people are traveling again. People are, even I am getting on airplanes again. You know, people are doing cross-country road trips. You know, it's interesting that you look at the different categories and the number one category in that outdoor uh, recreation activities actually is RVing in terms of the contribution because RVs are very expensive. They burn a ton of gasoline. So people are spending a lot of money on this. And I think it's just uh, it just shows that people are really getting back into this traveling thing again. And, you know, I think, you know the merits or lack thereof of RVing as specifically an activity, which I'm not particularly interested in, you know, I do think it is good that people are getting out there and doing stuff and, um, you know, and, you know, these reports are in some ways, they're almost a, as much as they are like data on the industry, they are in some ways intended also, I think sometimes to be a political document to sort of go to these, conservative politicians in utah and say 
look, what actually makes you money in Utah is not mining. It's people coming to the, you know, the big five national parks and, um, you know, making that case for them to support public lands and support national parks and not out of some, you know, hippie, we love the environment kind of thing, even if that might be what I go for, but out of the pure, you know, this is an economic driver for you. You know, I think what's the big challenge out of these things is the economic benefits of all this growth and how does that actually connect with outdoor recreation communities? You think about, okay, we spent $1 trillion on economic outdoor recreation, but if I buy an RV, if I, you know, buy a plane ticket from Alaska, you know, if I buy an RV to go drive to Moab, none of that, very little of that economic benefit actually goes to the community of Moab. You know, they're, whoever produced that RV is getting a bunch of money. The gas stations along the way are getting money. But that actual community in Moab, the community that, you know, I'm going there to do my rock climbing or hiking or running or whatever, mountain biking, whatever the activity I'm going there to do is, you know, the benefit is going to Alaska Airlines, who I bought my plane ticket from, or it's going to the gas stations along the way that are selling me the gas. And that community of Moab, the whole thing that's drawing me to go there, they're not seeing the economic benefits of that. They're not a, you know, that money that I'm paying in taxes isn't going to Moab to help them pay their teachers' salaries or something like that. It's going to, yeah, everywhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that we need to think of this is, yes, there's this huge economic impact to outdoor recreation, but it's incredibly unequally distributed. And, you know, when I, and I do my shopping, a bunch of my shopping at REI because it's convenient and there's one nearby where I can pick stuff up. But if I, you know, what's the difference between buying something at REI? And this is a cliche at this point, complaining about Amazon or something like that. You know, I think people have thought of this, but like the difference between this economic activity is not actually see we're not actually seeing the benefits of that economic activity from outdoor recreation flow to outdoor recreation communities. So if you are in Moab or you are in uh, Leavenworth or you are in, you know, Winthrop or any of these other uh, outdoor recreation hubs, how can we make sure as an, on an economic principle that some of the benefits of all of this, economic activity in the outdoor industry are actually going to the places that make it happen, that make it possible. So two things. Number one, I think the whole RVN category is all van lifing. So this is all, you know, Gen Z millennials who are jumping and buying themselves a sprinter van and <laughs> tour, touring the country. No, I'm kidding. I am curious because I actually think, and you, this is a little bit of a cliche, and needs to be a challenge because I'm actually surprised now, 20 years in this country, that I think, yes, compared to Europe, where in the Alps, chain businesses, corporate entities have very little um, space, right? I mean, these gondolas and these hotels, they're all owned by locals who own the valley. So, yes, mm -hmm. compared to the Alps, we have an economic infrastructure set up that does benefit uh, the remote corporations and not so much the little people on the ground that live and run their independent businesses. But I actually feel like they are doing well if they decide to take advantage of it. Like when you go to Leavenworth and you see how many businesses have survived over the last years, like, I don't, I feel like people are able to, if they live in these towns, take advantage of it if they want to. I think that many of these communities, um, yeah, you know, there's the resort community and people can't live there anymore because rich people buy all the Airbnbs and the ski leave tickets are getting too expensive. There's all this whole this conversation, but by and large, I mean, I mean, if you own a pizza joint in a town then you just 
have to be open when the tourists are there. Like, I want to throw this a little bit out as a challenge in saying, well, if the people are coming, take advantage of it. That, I mean, that's what the folks in the Alps do. They see, okay, uh, the farming isn't working for me anymore. Let me turn my farmhouse into a B&B and um, let me embrace tourism. And I think if you embrace it as a community, I think you can take advantage of it. I think there are some people who can take advantage of it. I think the guy who, the person who owns the pizza shop, they can, they make money, you know, because tourists come and buy the pizzas. I think the, you know, the person who owned the house that they bought, you know, 30 years ago before the place was a sexy outdoor recreation town and who now they have this house that they can rent out as an Airbnb, they can make money for on it. But what about, you know, the teacher who works in the school district are you know, is Leavenworth making enough money that it can pay its teachers a fair wage where they can live in Leavenworth? Or do they all have to live in Wenatchee and commute over? You know, and so I think, um, you know, and the more shopping, the more economic activity that happens in Leavenworth, as opposed to in other places, the more money that's spent in Leavenworth, the more that can stay in that community and can go to, you know, pay higher wages, uh, to support public services, like, you know, the education, and, you know, I'm sure they must have needs around childcare, and so on and so forth, you know, and so the idea is, if I'm going to go on a climbing trip in Leavenworth, I want to go climb Presick Peak or something like that, and I need some cams and a rope and rock climbing gear, you know, I could buy that directly from Black Diamond, or I could buy that from REI, or I could buy it from a, you know, climbing outdoor shop in Leavenworth um you know I think and I'm a hypocrite here because I bought all that stuff not in Leavenworth but you know you could buy that in Leavenworth and support that community that is there next to the outdoor recreation thing that you're trying to go do you know and so you know I and I want to be upfront and admit my own hypocrisy you know I'm I I probably don't do enough shopping myself in these mountain towns when I go visit them. Um, you know, I'm more likely to sleep in the back of my Subaru than I am to, you know, rent a hotel, or get a hotel room, that sort of thing. But um, it's it's more just sort of thinking about in general how much of the economic of that one trillion dollars that's spent on outdoor recreation, how much of that money actually stays in the outdoor recreation locations versus flows to REI corporate, Patagonia corporate, North Face corporate, et cetera. Yeah. Or, I mean, you know, and of course, because the biggest category is RVing and right. Odin. I mean, that's not even, at least REI kind of has, has a better outdoor connection than whoever builds RVs these days. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think your, your observation obviously stands, right? I mean, this is obviously not not one trillion dollars for Leavenworth and um, uh, Ocean Shores or whatever, right? Um, but I think the larger point for me in that is that we are sort of riding the wave of an upward swing, right? We've seen year after year before the pandemic it started. Throughout the pandemic, it was weirdly hampered but then exasperated in some respects that people love going into outdoors people buying more stuff people participating in more things trailheads are busier it's harder to get a campsites and like more and more people are going out right and i think there is i mean being part of sort of a, a growing environment always has challenges but it's also exciting because if patagonia makes more money then they will release more gear that is more specialized they can afford to bring the product out that you need right they're more you know i'm a race director if people are interested in trail running it's easier for me to get these races filled up it's easier for me to justify the time i spend on trying to put on an event like that right it's it's good it's a good feeling to be part of a sort of sector and in, an in industry, a sport, a pastime, whatever you want to call it, right? Where uh -huh. there's sort of more interest, there's more attention um, on it. There's growth because in, by and large, I think we get... We'll, we'll you know, the, the more... The attention brings us... Um, 
a lot more things that we can play with, if you will, right? To write it into something very like, I don't know, selfish, right? I mean, if there are more races, if more people want to run races, more races are selling out, more races are going to be offered. That's exciting. Yeah, and I absolutely, I mean, it's it's good that outdoor recreation is growing, even though a huge part of that is stuff like RVing and boating and stuff like that. You know, and I absolutely think, like I said, these are political documents in a sense. And, and I absolutely believe that these, you know, outdoor industry association people absolutely need to be taking these these facts and figures and taking them to conservative politicians and saying, look, you're making, you know, more people are being employed in your district because of outdoor recreation than because of mining or because, you know, and getting them to support public lands. And those. I think that that's all very important. I just think we, we shouldn't purely cheerlead it. I think we need to take, I think the community needs to take a look at how these benefits are actually being distributed, who's actually making money on it, who is not. And, you know, thinking about things like, you know, the Outdoor Industry Association, they're saying, oh, we need to support public lands, public lands, public lands. And then you say, how about a backpack tax to pay for public lands? And all of a sudden the tune changes. Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. Well, okay, actually, if you are this trillion dollar industry that is growing hugely, maybe we actually do need, you know, in the same way that hunting and fishing um you know, hunters pay an ammo tax that pays to for wildlife management. And we're able to, you know, it works out great. The hunters have animals to hunt. Uh, you know, they pay a modest tax. It's There's a clear nexus. And uh, it seems to be working out great. So if I want to have trails to hike on or run on, maybe I should pay a little bit of a tax on my hiking and running gear to pay for that. In the same way that there's that nexus with you know, the fish and wildlife and, you know, fishing gear and hunting gear, you know, but you talk to REI about that. And, uh, you know, I think their tune would very quickly change about how enthusiastic they are about making those, inv- you know, paying that that little bit. So I just think it's something that, w- that we need to consider, you know, what does this actually look like in practice and think about things like, like a backpack tax or, you know, how do we make sure that these benefits are being are going at least some to the 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 communities who are uh, making outdoor recreation possible. Yeah. No, absolutely. Another piece that's interesting in this report is that when you look at it broken down by segments is that running isn't listed as its own um segment. Like we mm-hmm. as you mentioned the boating and you mentioned the hunting and the RVing, right? There are these big categories, but there are also smaller categories like um, biking. And so I was, at first I was thinking, well, is running not on there because it's perhaps in a sports category? And then I drilled down and realized that part of the reason is that it's sort of mix, mixed in with the other activities that include walking. And so... The, the, the question that I'm having is our sport, and I'm including ra- road running there, is it unique enough that it should be standing on its own? Or is it too hard to distinguish because we don't buy boats and motorcycles? Um, we just buy running shoes. And so far, um, running shoes aren't as expensive as boats and motorcycles. Um, like our sport is sort of floating in this space in between, right? If it's like, I mean, you already pointed out that trail runners only walk half the time, right? Are yeah. we are we standing on our own or are we sort of mixed in with the walkers and the climbers, if you will? I mean, it's kind of tough. I feel like, especially in the case of trail running, it does feel like maybe it's difficult to distinct. I, I don't know how the economists who put these reports together exactly how they figure out what's what because it does it does uh seem like it would be a lot easier to tell this is in a boat you know this goes in the boat category because somebody bought a boat you know you you don't have to be a phd to figure that out you know and uh you know how do you tell this is a you know how some of these expenses break down you know and i also think you know you think about a a lot of these uh, is travel costs contributes to this, you know, mm-hmm. people who are traveling for that, that's economic activity, which is a big part of this report, you know, and 
you sort of think, well, you know, a lot of people travel for races, you know, they, they get on a plane to go visit some place to go do a race there. But actually, is it that many in the grand scheme of things? I mean, yeah, you know, there are races that draw hundreds and thousands of people, but, you know, does there, is that many people doing the New York City Marathon actually really stand out next to the so many, uh, you know, the, the number of people who go to the Grand Canyon or something mm-hmm. like that, who many of them just go to the Grand Canyon and they just go there to like take a picture at the rim and so, or something like that. Um, you know, the number of people who are going to, yeah, I just, I, I don't know exactly how to, I, I think personally, I would love to see it brought out as a running category, but you know, how do you tell how many Hoka shoes are bought by a trail runner versus you know, somebody who just wants to wear comfortable shoes because they have to stand all day at work. Um, I don't understand how you would necessarily do this in practice. So I don't blame them for, I understand why, why maybe they couldn't do it this way, but I, I think it is maybe a reminder of, you know, in the grand scheme of the outdoor industry that even though there are so many runners, a lot of people run, a lot of people even run races, um, but that we aren't necessarily we're still pretty small fish in the pond, you know, compared to, uh, you know, if you buy a couple pairs of a hundred dollars shoes a year, uh, that's a lot less than somebody who buys a $5,000 mountain bike or a hundred thousand dollar RV or a $50,000 boat or, you know, something like that, you know, we, and so I, I think that that's just sort of worth maybe reflecting on a little, a little bit, our place in the world. Yeah. Which is actually maybe a good thing, you know, maybe we all should be spending less money, but, um, but I mean, to be quite something. honest, I mean, from a, and perhaps I'm completely wrong in this observation, you can look at it from an economic point of view and you can say that the people that fly fish and the larger fishing, like recreational fishing industry, um, perhaps economically because of the gear that they're buying, especially if you add the boats and everything else to it, um, Perhaps they're a larger group, but by individuals, I can't imagine that um, there aren't more runners than fish anglers. I I might be wrong. It is just, Uh it it, it just, I mean, I feel like everybody at some point goes out running and fishing, like, I mean, not commercial, right? Recreation fishing is like a very, very niche sport, but even this. I mean, even if we don't have the data or if we go beyond this report, being in a niche is actually a good thing because we are specialized and we do our thing. And our sport is very unique in that sense that a lot of what we're doing in our sport is anchored around signing up for races, right? Which Uh is in the outdoor recreation thing. I think the amount of people that, have a mountain bike versus signing up for races, the amount of people that like fishing versus competitive fishing, right? I mean, I think the amount of people that like running, they actually like racing. So I think the racing part going beyond that report, right? Makes our sport in some respect fairly unique because the percentage of people participating in competitive events. Well, and I think when you talk about, I think the thing when you talk about that is, there's a big difference between people who enter races like the 5k turkey trot versus they do a marathon one time ever because it's something it's a bucket list kind of thing versus the people who are entering three or four races a year because they are super into ultra running and trail running kind of a thing and so i think uh you know i don't have any statistics in front of me about you know how many people do each of these categories but i would imagine that a whole lot of people who enter races are not habitual race enterers um you know they're not the people who are doing it again and again and again i think that there are a lot of runners who you know run a little bit for exercise and then every so you know at one point they decide oh it would be cool to do a half marathon or something like that but uh are not necessarily the people who are signing up for a ton of these. I would push back on that and say that if we look at the trail running world, if you call yourself a trail runner, you run races. 
being a trail runner inherently means you run a race. That's that would that's what I would say. I think that really, yeah, I would say. I just think that huh. very few trail runners who run trails without at least a race a year. Oh, I would disagree with that. I think ah, I like it. I I might be wrong. I just I'm, I think most I think most of them probably enter a race ever. I think a lot of people have tried it. Um, you know, most people tried it at one point or another. But uh, yeah, I think that there are a lot of people who, one, how many, yeah, I, I think that there are a lot yeah. of people who do the activity without racing often or barely ever. That that would be a funny statistic because I think that I could see somebody, right, doing the bucket list marathon once, but then they also stop running, right? They, are, they, they don't they could be done being a runner. But while you call yourself a trail runner, I think you get sucked into the vortex of the excitement of the community because there's a distinct difference between a hiker who purposely seeks solitude. That is sort of the definition. Nobody comes to a trailhead and says, oh, I'm so excited that the parking lot is slammed full, my hiking trail, uh, my hike that I'm going to be on, going on today is going to have hundreds of other people it will be so fun to high five them to wish them an amazing time out right that's that the hiker is the exact opposite but a trail runner likes the outdoors but defines itself by and large by seeking community which is very different to the average outdoor thing certainly not all of them there are some people i think who like to well i guess it comes down to a definition of what does it mean to be a trail runner i mean if there is if being a trail runner means that you go out on trails at faster than 10 minutes per mile sometimes, then I think that there are a lot of people who do that and never enter races. <clears throat> I don't think so. I feel like almost every run, every trail runner that I know, the conversation goes absolutely about what races they're going to be running at some point. Like it, it might be a long time in between. I'm not saying like it might be only one a year, but the people that I know that run, do you know a lot of trail runners who just do it for fun and they never sign up for a race? Uh, I think that there are some, I, I think I know, I know people who trail run for exercise and do not do races. They might not trail run super often, but they, and they might do like, for example, I mean, I'm thinking of like hikers, uh, you know, people who like to do hikers and mountaineers who I know from that community who, you know, they might have goal projects and events in so far as I want to climb this mountain. I'm, you know, but they have Strava accounts. I see them on Strava. I follow some of these people on Strava mm -hmm. who, um, you know, they have, who they do what I think everybody would recognize and call trail runs. Um, they have like having a Stra Strava account is kind of a th like, if you have a Strava account, you are in the sport, you are doing the thing. Um, but you know, they enter very few races. Uh, you know, I, I see these people, are they common? Well, you know, maybe not. And maybe some of this is just particular to the community that I'm in and the people I see. But I think that there are people who, and then it is also the question of identity. If you were to go up to them and you were to say, hey, so-and-so, are you a trail runner? They would probably not identify as I am a trail runner. They might you be, see. I and do you... trail run, but they wouldn't say I am a trail runner. So, yeah. May... If you, if that's my point, like I could see somebody who's yeah. a hiker and a mountaineer to say, because I feel comfortable driving to a trailhead in order for my general fitness. So, so I run trails every now and then from a fitness point of view, go to a city park where there are trails and stuff, right? As opposed to road running. But they don't define themselves as trail runners. If you are a trail runner, um, I think the definition is more so than any other activity is you, you are doing races. Uh-huh. I mean, I guess I'm thinking of, like an example would be as somebody who's been on this podcast a couple of times is like Jeremy Anderson. I mean, I don't want to speak for him, but do you think that that guy would say the words, I am a trail runner? Oh, 100%. And he signs up for more races. How much, 
How many then, races does he do? I mean, he did Barkley Fall Classic. He does. He did the Mount Baker Ultra. He regularly yes. does um, my Beast of Big Creek. I am absolutely. He. I'm actually surprised. I because he does so much other stuff. I assumed he doesn't do a lot of races, but he is actually very tuned in to what kind of races he wants to run, and he picks the hardest, the gnarliest in terms of vert mile type deal. But he runs a lot more races. It just gets diluted because he does so much other stuff. Well, but- you might be winning me over here. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm necessarily. But yeah, I, I think perhaps the, the people saying the phrase, I, I guess, but I don't want to close the door on people on that. There are, there are people out there, I'm sure, who would use the phrase, I'm a trail runner. And, and I don't want to necessarily say like, and I don't think you would want to do this either, is to say that like, if you are a person who does not run races, you aren't allowed to call no, yourself no, no, a trail no. runner. I no, know that's no. not what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, but I, yeah, I, I, I'm, you maybe got I'm, a point here, but. Yeah. I'm mainly saying it as a as a sort of unique and distinct a distinguishing factor, um, and I think it goes for runners in general, but trail runners. I think you can be a recreational. Anything else on that list of that that economic report, and by and large, you can enjoy the act- recreational activity, fishing, hunting, boating, biking, and you never enter races. Like okay. I think you, you can, but. Like the percentage of people who enjoy the activity and never participate in a sort of organized event, a competitive event, um, is much lower in any other category than in trail running or in running in general. How about this? And Anybody listening to this who considers themselves a trail runner and hasn't done a race in at least a year, send Matthias an email and tell him he's wrong. And uh, let's see how many emails you get. <laughs> okay. I I I think that I outside from outside from people who might be haven't done a race because they're injured or other life things. If you're trail runner, at some point in time that that comes. Up. And here's the point for me. The point for me is that, and this I alluded to this earlier. It's not so much about. I'm saying that you have to have a bib in order to be a trail runner. It's not about that. It's about that many of the outdoor activities a focused around finding solitude. You want to find the one campsite where then nobody else is around. You want to find the one climb that you can do where you don't have to wait in the crag for half an hour before you can get started, right? Um, you, 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 you try to find activities where you can be on your own. But in running, in trail running, the races create a unique community piece where you want to run trails, you're signing up to run trails in order to be in community. And I, in, and I find that unique in the outer world. Again, not unique in a sense that that's the only way and there aren't other areas where that also exists, right? I mean, boaters meet up at certain coves and whatever, right? There's obviously that casual gathering or friends go camping together. Of course that exists, right? <laughs> But by and large, I mean, 10,000 people uh, were trying to get 270 spots to run Western states, right? I mean, they're not saying, oh, Western states is overcrowded. I'm going to run the one race where nobody is signed up. No, they're saying, I want to run that race because it sells out, because it's busy, because I'm around other people. There's a unique different approach to how we engage with each other and with the outdoors. I would disagree maybe a little bit with that because I think that there's a lot of people who want to do the big high profile thing in, in all these activities. I mean, those RVers, a lot of them want to go to the Grand Canyon, even though the Grand Canyon is super crowded and they know it's going to be crowded. It's those, but they hate it. Utah. They go there and complain then. Everybody who yeah, shows and up and people complain about the western state about not being able to get into the western states lottery because they don't get in. But but, uh, if, if but you get, I, but if I you think get in, then you're not complaining that it's too crowded. Oh, nobody think... nobody gets into UTMB and says, "Man, that race is overcrowded." And I mean, unless but then, but then you shouldn't run it. Then you're an idiot. I think the basic idea that that people want to go to these 
popular high profile spots or events you know people want to go to the grand canyon people want to go to western states people want to hike cascade pass in the north cascades um you know people get drawn to these big high profile events uh in every in every category and yes there are you know the niche people who want to go off and do the thing all by themselves. But I think a lot of us want to go do the famous thing. They want to go do the high profile thing. They want to go do the thing that they've seen on social media. And I think that that's true of running and it's true of all the other activities too, by and large. Yeah, no, I agree that it's true, but the difference is the the complaining piece. <laughs> that's the, that's my thinking that you sign up for the high profile thing where a lot of people as a trail runner and you're excited to be around other people wherein you run rim to rim to rim and you wish you would have fewer people. You, you, you know it that there are other people on the trail. Again, you know, I, I uh, enjoy this conversation immensely because um, it's easy to have a podcast and always agree with everything. And it's good to sort of look at it from different perspectives. My next piece is sort of if, the races are such an important piece of our community. Um, there is an additional element of focus on the races. And we've seen this over the last few weeks play out in um, a massive way with um, the whole Whistler kerfuffle when without retelling the entire story, I expect mm -hmm. everybody to have heard about it. But it's like there are race organizations and race directors putting on events, sort of giving specific places meaning, if you will. And um, then we have economic forces and businesses that are coming in and are sort of changing the meaning of what it means to run a trail race. Now we see stones for UTMB. You don't just run a race at a certain place for the sake of running it. And enjoying it, you're doing it as a stepping stone, literally, to get into another event. So these races play a huge piece of how we experience the outdoors, our own recreation, and each other as a as a community, right? I mean, they, they are a pivotal part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know... The one thing, you know, you mentioned about, you know, what makes talking about what makes running different than other things. And yeah, it is. I do think that one thing that's interesting about running is that it is centered around, you know, in the same way that RVing might be centered around these particular national parks that are big draws, um, you know, that we've chosen not just events, but competitive events as sort of what are focal points are is is kind of an interesting and unique thing about running and trail running yeah and i mean it it allows us to expand the outdoors if you will because if we would be just hikers then we would just focus on the national parks we would just focus on the few national most beautiful places but because we can't run races in the national parks we naturally have to expand um, where we run, right? And uh, uh, something as naturally not as significant as, you know, some desert strip where Havelina happens or so, right? Um, uh, becomes an important aspect, a, a, a point where runners go to and know about and flock to, um, even though it's sort of, naturally doesn't have any significance right yeah it's because it, of the human community built around it because of the human community built around it right i mean you're sort of setting and this is in some respects right i mean bringing it back to the alps why the big resort towns are as big in the alps is because they all at some point hosted the olympic games right i mean chamonix was the host of the first winter olympics garmisch partenkirchen innsbruck um, Cortina d'Ambrezzo, all of these places that we know that now have the biggest races and the biggest tourism draw, they all got their start sometime in the early 20th century because they were host to the Olympic Games. So the idea yeah. of being a host city, right? Auburn is 
not really a city to write home about by itself, right? It's made special because of Western states, right? And so race directors, by and large, have sort of the ability to be, I mean, I know I'm overblowing this a little bit, but they are sort of history makers. You can put a specific location on the map. I mean, that's the whole point why hard rock exists, right? I mean, an old mining town that economically was challenged, let's put an event uh, into this area to give uh, to give it an economic boost, right? And so I think there's something really fascinating there going back economically from an economic point of view, but also from a community builder and how we as a community talk about these places and these events and schedule our lives around them. I think you're, I think you are right about that. And that the, um, you know, the power and then also to some degree response, you know, with power comes responsibility that race directors have around that is, is interesting. And the, the, the impact on, you know, I think about gravel cycling is a great example of this in the same kind of way of like Emporia, Kansas, which is a town nobody has probably ever heard of before the Unbound event started. And now is kind of a big deal in the gravel community, um, you know, put on the map in the same way. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's a point well taken. Yeah. Happens in cycling too. Yeah. So, and then the next phase for me is that interesting aspect that, 10 years ago, when trail running sort of first made it onto the social media scene, or perhaps social media sort of caught on to it, trail running existed in many ways through the YouTube videos of the first person, sometimes documentary experiences of the runner running a certain event, right? There are countless stories of people getting into trail running because I mean, not because they run watch the Barkley marathons. I don't think everybody, anybody who watches that Netflix documentary, says, I want to do that. That's more of a like, what the fuck is going on here? But like the videos that we see, um, Europeans love the Western States videos. These desert canyons, these hot canyons, they love the idea of of running in that environment because it's so unique and different, and vice versa. We Americans, we see runners in front of the glaciers. Um, at the Mont Blanc, and they say that is trail running. And if, many years ago, that existed through these documentary videos. And increasingly now, this is becoming live streaming. And I'm fascinated by this. Do you tune into live stream races? Do you see yourself as a trail running spectator? You know, I. <sighs> I think a couple times I've watched a little bit of some of the UTMB live streams, but I would not consider myself a trail running spectator. And, you know, I think what's interesting about it is, at least for me, you know, I don't want to, you know, there's ex there's exciting things happening on the races for these people. You know, they are having to dig deep and make decisions about how hard they can and cannot push and you know, it's, there is certainly drama. There's the drama about, you know, you're sitting in the chair at the aid station and you're one, you know, can I get up and push on, you know, there's the drama about the, you know, the elite who's wondering if they have, you know, can they pass the person in third because they're in fourth. Um, but the actual watching of the videos of the live streams seems kind of boring to me beyond just like a little bit of this being an interesting novelty. That's for me personally. I mean, Apparently there are other people who watch them, but I don't know. I, you know, I think what I have enjoyed about, I like the idea of cameras being on course, but it seems like to me, the better way to relate that is to put together the highlight reel. You know, I think about, you know, there are a couple race videos that I have watched that were actually really good. You know, I think about that, um, that one from the North phase 50, the Miller versus Hawks, from like 2017 or something like that. Like it was a great video uh, that was, it showed some exciting racing, but also the important thing is it was like less than 10 minutes long. If my, my recollection is it was about 10 minutes long, maybe shorter, definitely less than 15 minutes. And so it was the kind of thing that somebody with our modern, incredibly short attention spans could actually sit down and watch and enjoy. And you're not, it was showing you the, it was showing you the best part. It was showing you, uh, some great vistas it was showing you two guys running really fast um being very competitive 
and yeah, it wasn't boring. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I, I the idea of sitting down and watching six hours of Black Canyon does not sound interesting to me at all. You know, I think when you look at the other video, like uh, the Western States Unbreakable video, it was a highlight reel put together after the fact. You know, the Barkley documentaries highlight reels put together after the fact. You know, the idea of having cameras on course to put this kind of stuff together makes sense to me, but. I don't understand necessarily the appeal of the live stream. That's me, though. I think that there, I, I'm I'm in the same boat. I I don't see myself as a spectator at all. I think that there is the the special thing about live is that feeling of drama that can't be scripted, that can't be controlled, uh-huh. right? You need to log in because you might see something, experience something, witness something that um, is astonishing. I mean, Courtney's last few miles at UTMB last year when she made herself over that coal and hundreds of people were up there. That was a experience in trail running that has never happened before. And being able to experience that live was truly spectacular, right? But these races are long. Most races are ultras and sort of the expectation of sitting for 36 hours in order to capture that one glimpse, lightning in a bottle, seems um, unjustifiable for me too, right? Yeah. But race directors increasingly adding these on and it becomes an expectation and I've been asking myself these live streams. And I've been asking myself, what's the ROI? What's the return of investment? Why does it happen? Because many ways of race director's core um, challenge is to create a good experience for the runner. And I don't see the runner who is actually signed up, not the runner who might run it in two years, but the runner who's actually signed up with the bib having a, a specific benefit from the race being live streamed. And so if it's not for the runner, why does it exist? I think the, I, I, I think there is truth to that. I think the argument against would be if these live streams actually are growing the sport, then Maybe we are bringing in new people. Maybe we can get somebody else new interested in trail running. Somebody who will say, oh, that actually was kind of cool. I'd like to watch, you know, I'd like to try that out. And now next year, they're going to be a runner. Um, You know, I people talk about the idea that, you know, Matthias is running an ultra marathon and he tells his non-runner friend Alex, hey, watch the live stream because you're going to see me at some point. And then Alex tunes in and is like, wow, that's so cool. I want to do that. Um, you know, I think that's the argument that they would make. To me, I see that uh, I see the value proposition in using media to bring new people into the sport. The question to me is, is live streaming actually the best way to do that? Because if I am not a runner and my friend tells me, hey, watch an eight hour live stream because at some point I'll be on screen for 10 seconds. I'd say, no, thanks, dude. Mm -hmm. Um, But if there's a highlight reel, maybe I would watch that, you know? And so I, I think the idea of using media to bring people into the sport makes a ton of sense and is worth spending money on, even though it doesn't necessarily benefit the runner in the race today. But I'm not sure if live streaming is the way to do that. I think the only, I mean, I am somebody who is a, considers my, I am probably a pretty hardcore into running person. And even I don't watch live streams. So if they're not getting me, then they have a really long way to go to get the non-runners, I Mm -hmm. feel like. So yeah, I see the value proposition of spending money on media to bring people into the sport, even though it doesn't benefit the runner in the race today. But I don't know about live streaming. I think it's also worth bringing up just as an aside that the most important piece of media ever for ultra running, more than any video, anything else, is the book Born to Run. You know, and so I just think when we think about, you know, and that book had its issues certainly around 
all sorts of things. But that, I mean, that, I feel like that was kind of the thing that kicked off the ultra running boom of, you know, the 2010s. So I just think it's kind of worth thinking about, you know, that's just something I, I think worth keeping in mind because, you know, when you sort of set this up talking about, you know, these, these videos like Unbreakable and stuff like that, 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 you know, really the granddaddy of them all was, was born to run. Mm. Yeah. I can see that, but I also think as race directors investing in, in live streaming, they might say it's for the growth of the sport, but I think it's for the growth of the sponsor attention, right? Because you talk to a sponsor and you say, Hey, I've got 300 runners coming to my race and, you know, 20 people at the aid stations or whatever, right? I have a total addressable market of whatever, 400 people because no spectators uh, are coming to our races yet. But if you have a live stream, you can say, and your sponsor message will be shown to X amount of people on the live stream. I how think, big is that number is X though? I mean, that's the I, thing. If I was a sponsor, I, I, I would be like, how how many people are actually watching your live stream? And hey, if, if if a ton of people are watching the live streams, then we're wrong. And actually they're really popular. I mean, if they actually are getting these huge viewership numbers and if they're getting tiny viewership numbers, then if the sponsors want to waste their money on something that nobody's going to watch, then, you know, I'm not going to shed a tear for Hoka. Go for it, guys. You yeah. Know? No, so, abso- absolutely. But I think it's an interesting strategy because there's a huge difference between having a couple people on the f- um, uh, during the race and making a little, you know, highlight reel from an expense point of view versus trying to live stream, right? I mean, that's why I'm saying the ROI of live stream because I feel like the cost to live stream event is so much higher than to just make a highlight reel. Uh, that in order to invest into that, you must have a way to pay for it. And it cannot be, or it should not be, through increasing the price of the bib. I mean, the cost to make the highlight reel probably depends on how good of a highlight reel you want it to be. I mean, if you want to catch every highlight, then you probably need to have the same kind of camera coverage that live streaming would take, if not even more. Um but you don't. That's the beauty, right? I mean, all you have, because media tells the stories. I mean, ultimately, yeah, sure, if you make a three-minute highlight reel and you miss a couple pieces, some people will point out, oh, you you missed a couple pieces. But in the end, it, nobody nobody remembers. You still need, yeah, I don't know. I Well, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not going to debate the exact, you know, cost of, of either thing. But I, I think that I think that there is... I think a case can be made if you authentically think it's going to grow the sport to invest money in that. Um, You know, I think ideally that money comes from sponsors. I mean, I think when you interviewed the guys at the guy at UTMB, you know, something that they said, I think it was in your interview with him, which makes sense, made sense to me was that money from the racers entry is spent on the racers experience. And that money for stuff like a live stream or media or et cetera comes from sponsors. Mm -hmm. And that kind of a relationship makes a ton of sense to me. And I think I would encourage sponsors to do that. I mean, I think if they want to spend that money on that kind of um, that sort of stuff, I, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, talking about, you know, like what Solomon's approach to the global uh, golden trail series is where they say, look, if, you know, if we can grow the sport, Solomon is saying, we're going to try to grow the sport because we know if the sport grows, then Solomon is going to grow with it. That makes sense to me. You mm-hmm. know, go try to grow the sport and make do that spending. Um, you know, so I, I just wonder, is live streaming actually the way to do that? I don't know. I, it doesn't seem like it to me, but I'm also not the one who's running the numbers and doing these calculations. If I worked at one of the big shoe sponsors, I think I would be skeptical, but who knows what they're seeing that we don't see? Um, as a side, with all of our he- um, hesitation around live streaming, I um, talked to somebody down in Portland who offers live streaming services with, to try to get a quote to see what it would cost to live stream Beast of Big Creek. So I am equally wondering how these pieces fit together, who pays for it, and what's the experience that we're getting out of it. 
and fascinated by the idea of sort of using live stream just as another way of telling the story of a race, of an event. Right? Um, so we'll see. Maybe Beast of Big Creek is going to be live streamed in 2024. Uh-huh. Maybe. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. Will it ch- will it change the race? Will it change the experience? It certainly will change my expenses for for the event. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I well, mean, if I tell you that, let's put you on the spot. If I tell you that, does that make you more or less likely want to run the race? If I would tell you, hey, be so big, it's gonna live be live streamed in twenty four. Are you thinking about oh? Now I want to run it, or is it a complete non-factor? Were you as a runner considering signing up? For me, the only factor that would play into it is that presuming that it would be like watchable on demand later, um, you know, I would never like ask my family and friends to watch the Beast of Big Creek live stream because it's assuming it's something like you put a camera up on the summit of Mount Eleanor, pointed at the trail, so that you can see people coming up and down. Um, I would never say, hey, watch the whole thing live and at some point I'll be on there. But I think I would for sure go back and I would like pull a video clip of here's the five seconds where you could see me and I would post that on my Instagram story. Um, That said, like that's basically like what you get from a race photographer. And Mm -hmm. so the question is, you know, I like I like having race photographers on course. I usually buy a photo when I do a race that has photographers. you know, and so if I'm getting pretty much the same value add to me as the runner from the live stream as I do from a race photographer, you know, which is the easier one for you to do as the race director, it's hire the photographer for sure. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I I agree with you on that. Um since we are already putting you in a spot, you have not been somebody we you know you came when we first met um you came from sort of from the fkt world from the adventure world this is sort of what connected us we've not actively talked about seriously trying to run qualify for specific races and i remember you telling me that just before the Whistler thing came out that you were sort of thinking about, hmm, maybe I should go for some stones and Whistler perhaps would be a great location because it's close by. Before, let's have two parts of this conversation. What attracted you to the idea of trying to get stones and how much has this changed? You know, I think... I actually started trail running really interested in races, you know, and so, and, and it's been, I have also, you know, I've done races almost every year that I've considered, you know, since I've started trail running and I, I don't think I, I didn't do any in 2020, of course. Um, I don't, I I haven't done them every year, but it's, it's always been a part of it. And, you know, I, I do think that there is something to, like you've talked about with the community being around a whole bunch of people, it's not necessarily what you want to do every time, um, you know, and it's nice to, I think it's maybe a little bit different for us here in the Pacific Northwest because we do have these wonderful wilderness areas to go to in our backyard. It's actually in some ways more convenient to go to, you know, Mount Rainier National Park than it would be to go to, you know, canyons or uh, the canyons race or, you uh, Black Canyon or or any of these relatively high profile, you know, US race events because like, yeah, I've got a better place to go to than than that race is in. You know, but I don't know. The idea of I guess part of it is when you there is an element, first of all, I think that when you do have competition, it brings out the best in people you know, and that could be competition in terms of, am I going to win the race or am I going to get second place? Or it could be competition of, am I going to get a hundredth place or 99th place, you know? And I think anytime you are on, like when you are in that race environment and you are, you've got 
four miles to go and you can see somebody on the trail a hundred yards ahead of you and you're feeling good, that is going to get the best possible performance out of you. When you have that person in front of you who you can hunt down or when you're in that those final couple miles of the race and you, you know you've got somebody 100 yards behind you and you're thinking, geez, I really would prefer not, to, you know. And yeah, it's who really cares who gets 100th place. But, um, you know, when you're in that con- competitive environment and you feel that way, you can get a really good performance out of yourself. So I think that for people who want to push their own limits and have put in their best physical performance – And really get 100% out of themselves, which sometimes that's me. The way to do that is in a race. I also think for people who want to push themselves to the limits, the race is also a safer environment to do that in. If you are going out by yourself into the backcountry, you never want to give 100% because what if something goes wrong and you need to have something left in the tank, you know? And so for people who are you know, pushing the distance or the difficulty or really want to go as fast as they possibly can, um, you know, the race environment is a safer way to do that. You mm-hmm. know, obviously there are people who also go as fast as they possibly can for an FKT attempt or something like that. And, you know, good for them. But, you know, the fact is like, and they, good for them and that's cool. But mm-hmm. the fact is that there is an element of extra risk involved there that you, and yes, people can still, be injured or die in races it happens and it's a tragedy but it's uh yeah there's an element of safety there of having people around you of having a you know a race director who's expecting you to come back at the end of the day and it will sort of notice that, that you know one of their runners hasn't checked in at the finish you know that kind of a thing there's an element of safety there so you know i don't know and then i don't know it's also there's an element of like just cool mm-hmm. you know like, I, I I don't know. I think that there's an element of it's just cool to do some. It's just a cool event, you know. Mm-hmm. And some of these races are, and uh, so I don't know. I and the definition of what's cool is obviously it's different for every person, and oftentimes you can't define exactly what is cool or not. But I mean, there are races that I see, and I think. That's not cool. That I don't. I don't think that that's cool. And there are some races you see, and you're like, "Whoa, that's cool," mm. you know. And uh, so, for you, UTMB is that something that you consider cool? Like the idea of racing in Europe in a super high profile event in terms of like just busyness left and uh, right. We've not. We've never talked about this. Is that something, or did you consider the UTMB races here in the US just because? they are more higher profile and it would be just fun to be in that atmosphere, but the stones and the possibility of flying to uh, Chamonix, it wasn't really on your radar. I I think the idea of racing around Mont Blanc is cool of people getting together and say, let's see how fast we can go around Mont Blanc. That's just a cool thing. That's just a cool idea. It's, you know, it's, it's it's the ultimate story. I I still can't find another race that even comes remotely close to that. Uh, I, I uh, agree with you. It's an iconic mountain. It's a the idea of the circumnavigation is cool. Um, you know, going as fast as you can is cool. I don't know. It's just you know, and and the merits or lack thereof, specifically with the UTMB organization. Like the basic idea of the race is extremely cool. <laughs> I I I love that you don't have more flowery words, but the the tone in your voice says it all. The way you say it's just really cool. It's perfect. I love this. So, how has it changed in these last few weeks? Has it changed? In, how do well, you feel I... about everything that's happened? Um, you know, at the same time as somebody who thinks UTMB is cool and and likes to do races from time to time. It is also a thing where it's like, you know, we have limited time and money and you uh, can invest it in certain things and not in other things. And, you know, what is more interesting, if you're looking at something to do in October, what is more interesting, you know, to go do one of these UTMB races or to go do rim to rim to rim of the Grand Canyon? 
Either way, you've got to spend some money on something. Either way, you've got to get on a plane and travel. Either way, you've got to travel for it and, you know, or you've got to train for it and make it somewhat of a priority. Um, you know, which is going back to the idea of what is cool, you know, which is cooler, the Kodiak 100K or the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim to Rim? You know, I think I would make the argument that the Grand Canyon probably is cooler. You've done, you know, you've done Rim to Rim to Rim and you've, you've been there at Kodiak. So you could maybe, you know, you know, you would know more than I would in terms of, you know, commenting specifically on that kind of a thing. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, we have to make those kind of decisions and uh, prioritize our time and, and how we're going to spend our vacation and our money and our training. And, uh, you know, I I don't know. The idea of, and the bigger investment that you have to make, the harder that decision is, you know. Actually trying to go to do UTMB is, let's be honest, it's a huge investment. You have to do all these by UTMB races. You have to train and travel and spend money on each one of those. And you have to do them successfully. And then you have, I mean, it's a huge investment. And it's also got a huge opportunity cost because you could be doing different things instead along the way. And, um, you know, I feel like in a big world where there are so many things to do, you know, I will, if there was a free entry to UTMB sitting out there, I would you know, absolutely zero doubt in my mind, I would want to do it. Um, but in the value, you know, the idea of the opportunity cost of the things that you, I would have to skip along the way to actually go through the whole thing. I just don't really see. I just don't really see it for myself, you yeah. know, and that's, you know, I don't, I don't think I have concerns about, you know, the community or that UTMB is some evil organization. You know, I think, you know, what went down in the Whistler case is not cool. You know, I think it would be better if, you know, Gary's, uh, the the Whistler Alpine Meadows race still existed. I think that that would be a better world. I wish it did. Um, I would consider doing, I would, you know, I, I was never really in shape to do any of the longer distances there in past years. And, um, you know, but it's one I've, I'd always sort of thought about, oh, that would be on the, on the someday list. Um, but also, I mean, I don't, I think there are many runners who are in the same kind of boat where it's like, well, that seemed like kind of a an, a bad thing that happened. I'm not happy about it. But also, I think the people who are really the most angry about it are people who have been hardcore anti-UTMB for a long time. And, I, and there are some of those people who have argued for years about problems with UTMB and I understand where they're coming from. There's some truth to their argument. Um, but I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it doesn't, it's not something that I feel super strongly about one way or the other personally. Yeah. It's interesting. You're not just, you bringing up the like opportunity cost. You could run rim to rim to rim or somewhere else. Right. I think that's, again, that speaks to the difference in our sport. Like if you're a climber, like Alex Honnold doesn't think of next year and say, oh, well, you know, the um, Olympics are in Paris. Maybe I should um, structure my, my my training and my life around competing in the Olympics, right? For him, as a climber, it's only his personal projects. That's the only thing that he cares about, right? Sure, sponsor commitments to make sure that these projects I have a certain visibility and storytelling aspect to it. But in general... He doesn't think of certain events that compete with this. And this is sort well, of the unique way. Yeah, I'm going to actually push back. That specific example of the Olympics, Adam Andra is probably the best sport climber in the world who actually did stop doing his personal projects because he wanted to compete in the Olympics and probably didn't do as well as he could have at the Olympics because he still spent too much time on real rock instead of on plastic. So I would actually push it. Honold, obviously, but that's because Honold isn't a competition climber. I, there's a lot of nuances there in climbing. No, no, there is, there is. But I think in general, if you look at the whole climbing world, right, there are very few people who see themselves as competition sports climbers compared to the large the large world right if you go to the average rock gym uh, and you f uh, ask people and you say hey what are your plans for next year i think there are very 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 few people who will say oh 
I'm doing a competitive race, um, a competitive climbing event as opposed to um, I'm going to work on my own project somewhere, right? Uh, uh, when we as trail runners, we always find ourselves in this challenge of should I sign up for a race, cost, money, time, focus of training and everything else, right? Going to experiencing a specific location versus am I chasing sort of these these dreams and there are very few locations rim to rim to rim is a personal outing in a national park it will never have a race there are very few locations where the race destination and the sort of scenic destination really come together whistler was one of them i mean i ran squamish twice and Squamish is an amazing event, and I love Gary's races. And it's probably one of the absolute best races organizationally that you can participate in. But it's coastal mountains. It's very, very similar from a trail experience to the races, to, to the um, trails that we run here every single day. Many of the trails felt like Capital Forest. And sure, you've got some nice glaciers in the distance, but overall, the trails weren't that unique. I think Whistler would have been different, right? The Whistler event, the, the destination, Whistler was for me the one location. And I had said that right from the get-go when um, Gary first introduced Wham, this is the event that had all the pieces to rival UTMB in North America in the long run. It had the tourist destination, it had uh, cl close proximity to an international airport, enough hotel beds, and um, absolute gorgeous scenery with glaciers everywhere and stuff, right? Yeah. Well, um, and I think it's really too bad because I think you are kind of right about that. And that, you know, the well, ha you know, just speaking, I said I wasn't that disturbed about it, but it is really, it sucks because people are not going to, a lot of people are not going to want to do this Whistler race with justification. I wouldn't sign up for it. I don't think people aren't going to volunteer. And so, you know, it's, it's too bad that this place that could be the host of an iconic event is going to be the event, uh, the host of what will most likely be a not very successful event. And that's too bad. That's a big bummer. And it's, and it sucks that it ultimately, yeah, it is like Iron Man's fault to some degree. Not entirely, but to some degree, you know, I don't know. It, it sucks. I think it is Iron Man's fault, Iron Man U Team Speed's fault, because they should have managed the PR around it better. I think, mm -hmm. I don't think it, um, a business can only control its own narrative, and a business needs to anticipate what other people are doing. They knew. They were entering a competitive life um, environment. They knew that there, there was the possibility of pushback, and they handled it, handled it about as poorly as he could have handled it. Uh -huh. um, and so now they are sitting in the bed that they've made, if you will. Right? And so I put the responsibility for the ongoing success squarely into UTMB's hands because there's nobody out there who actively is going to um, sabotage it. I mean, you know, they also knew that by entering that environment, they need volunteers for this, for this event, right? And so um, do I agree with the way Gary has handled his PR around this event? No, absolutely not. I don't think he's done the community a service but that has nothing to do with the Whistler event. The Whistler event is going to exist and is going to be um, handicapped by um, the doings of UTM's Beast PR department. You know, one comment I saw about it that I thought was kind of interesting and perhaps, you know, an image to how the race might go is that the UTMB and... Whistler are actually perfect fits for each other because they're both things for tourists and not for locals. They're both expensive and, and big and national that this is, you know, the whole, that 
I don't know that that whole idea that they are a tourist thing and not a locals thing, and that actually in some ways that they're a good match. I was like, oh, maybe there is actually something to that because there's a lot of issues with Vale as a ski resort and you know, the complaints about that and that it's all about bringing in people from outside to pay for ridiculously expensive lift tickets, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can see that. All right. We talked a lot. I've kept you for a long time. Should we close it off by talking about some of the biggest achievements this year in the sport? What were some of the, of the big wins? What were some of, some of the, the big outstanding storylines that we've, we've sort of witnessed, we've sort of followed. Yeah, I mean, I guess you can't talk about it without talking about Courtney DeWalter having this incredible season, um, you know, winning and setting course records at arguably, the, you know, I would say actually maybe inarguably the three most important events in the sport, uh, Western States, Hard Rock and UTMB. I think what I'm kind of interested to see is, you know, at this point, Courtney is, she's accomplished so many things she's so dominant, like what's next, you know? And there are some people who are maybe happy with, okay, I've set the course record. Now I want to set the course record at that same rest at that same race, 15 minutes faster. Maybe she wants to win UTMB four times in a row or five times in a row or whatever, you know, like, or maybe she wants to do other stuff. And what does, you know, Courtney's future in the sport, look like i'm really fascinated to see whether she wants to just keep on you know getting five percent better each year kind of a thing or uh or what does that look like i'm also interested to see i mean she is so dominant at these 100 mile mountainous races like in some ways the more interesting story isn't courtney dewalter herself it's someday there's somebody's gonna surpass her who is that person going to be and what's that going to look like? And in some ways looking forward towards that is, is, is maybe a more interesting story. But I think that that's, I mean, that she's the story of the sport this year. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, I agree when her achievement, but again, it also speaks to how much of the storylines and the visibility in our sport hinges around races because Carol Sabe, I don't know how his name is pronounced at Belgian uh-huh. dentist. Um, finishes Barclay at the beginning of the year and then um, runs the PCT and gets the FKT on it in one year. Uh-huh. And I don't know if because our sport is US centric or because if we're just focusing on races more than any other achievement, that is an absolute bonkers of a year, right? Yeah, I mean, I obviously I have a lot of opinions about FKT kind of stuff. I mean, I think honestly what counts against him for that is there has been so much action and his time is really, I mean, he blew Timothy Olson's time out of the water on the PCT. I think the PCT has been a little over, uh, overdone in the FKT space, you know, Olson's run on it. Uh, all the issues, you know, Josh Perry last year, uh, a lot of action on it again today, this year, there was, there was a women's self-supported on it this year. There was a men's self-supported on it this year. There was a men's Carol Sabe's supported on it this year. I mean, it's just like, you know, and every PCT run has so much controversy and talk about where were the fire closures and what reroutes they have to do. Um, at this point, I mean, I would kind of be interested in hearing, seeing more talk in the FKT space about things that aren't the PCT. Um, even though it is this incredible iconic trail, it's also like there are other incredible iconic trails out there. Let's talk more about those and a little bit less about the PCT. Maybe. I mean, I don't know. When it, when it comes to the larger PE FKT world, I 100% agree with you. But when it comes to his achievement, um, if the route is extra competitive, then it speaks only more to uh, what he's achieved on there, right? No doubt, no doubt. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's easy for anybody to pick a FKT that nobody has ever heard of route and then slay it and say, wow, look what I've done, right? But the fact that Timothy Olsen, who was fully supported, fully dialed in for his FKT, um, gets, Carol get, it beats him on this by, you know, a reasonably a large margin, right? It just speaks to this absolutely immense achievement and speaking of um just performances of the year that 
yeah, we're completing Barclay. I suppose that's the right term when it comes to Barclay, right? You don't win Barclay. Completing Barclay and then the BCD in one year, that's a good year of running. That is a good year of running. And Carol Sabe, I mean, he's done a lot of other big FKTs, both in the US and in Europe. So, I mean, he's he's the real deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think, honestly, and he does it with a day job. That's pretty cool to me. I mean, for me, I didn't want to bring it up when I, when we talked about Courtney, but for me, that's the big story in sports that Courtney seemingly does running full time. One could say that, you know, her sponsor is an influence or obligations, you know, are, are equally important. I don't know. Um, but she is probably one of the very few runners in the women's sport that does it full time. I mean, Katarina Hartmut, um, who came in second at UTMB um, and was not in the same sphere, but still came in second um, and would have won this thing if Courtney wouldn't have shown up. I mean, she has a full-time job at a university or a part-time job. I don't know how many hours she take it, dedicates to it, right? But she gets very little. I mean, she isn't even... Hoka internationally sponsored. She is only sponsored by Hoka Europe, right? Uh-huh. And so, right. And I think that they, if you look at Hannes Namberger, like most of, I don't think there's a single German trail runner who actually does it one, does the sport 100% full time. Everyone has a side job. And that I it didn't want to bring it up because we talked about the performances, but looking at what the sport can grow into or perhaps never should grow into perhaps it's fascinating to see that a full-time athlete i mean wamsley won utmb and um, ludo came in fourth or fifth or so and i think he has a job too right and he's in mid 40s right like the the the, the separation between the pro who's 100 percent dialed in the sport and a person who is dedicated super you know, skilled and everything, but does it as side job is still within spitting distance. And that's fascinating because you're not going to show up at any of the other professional sports and think you're going to like, you know, throw hoops with some of the big NBA stars. It's not going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm not going to go step on a field with Messi and saying, today, today, I'm going to have a good day. <laughs> you know, they have worlds apart when it doesn't feel like an hour sport they are truly worlds apart yet yeah it's it's also difficult for me to relate just as somebody who is worlds apart (laughs) (laughs) good point good point i mean i can't even finish on races myself so i get it but we still in 23, line up at the same starting line. And I think that makes our special, uh, sport special, right? We still uh, run the same trails. We still run the same races. Um, I think that's fun. And um, yeah, I mean, for me, that motivates me. Not the idea of potentially competing or beating any of these athletes, but uh, being able to toe to the same starting line Potentially say hi to the same people, be, you know, be humans together because these people are humans, right? They're not like weird aliens flying in from outer space. They want to be humans um, and want to be treated as humans. And so it's it's kind of fun to sort of see that this is all one big community, even though the elites are trying to pull away um, by professionalizing their experiences, which, you know, I give them all the you know, right to, I don't have a problem with them sort of wanting to do that. When I think it comes maybe back full circle a little bit in closure, uh, just talking about, you know, and that's been a through line throughout this conversation is the sort of the community of trail running and how races are these central places where we all come together and attract all of us. and, And that being an important part of it, whether you are running for the win or running for, 500th place you know we all got attracted there by the event we got it all attracted there by the place and um for those who are racing at least and all the trail runners who out there who don't race 
are great too because i know there's a lot of you but <laughs> but uh yeah i think there's something to that but i mean you know i mean to your point i mean even if you set out to do rim to rim to rim right i mean you know that jim wamsley at some point in the past history crushed this thing at an insane time um and jeff browning regularly runs these trails right so it's it is even if you don't sign up for races right i mean you see their segment splits <laughs> you can check on yeah. strava what um routes some of these people do and it does feel like you are connected with them it does feel like we are we are a community yeah well cool alex Thank you so much for your time. Um, you've given me a lot of your time. And thank you for sort of recapping the year with me. And, um, well, we'll see each other in a week at Saturnalia, one of the most competitive ultra races in the world. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully people found it interesting. And, uh, yeah, feel free to, I think, uh, post on the uh, single track podcast Instagram page with comments about all the things that we got wrong and uh, and and all that sort of stuff because I think we're eager to hear it. Absolutely, Alex. Do you want to link people anywhere to your Instagram? What's your most active platform? Uh, probably just Strava. Although actually, unfortunately, the last couple of weeks not so much. Maybe, but uh, yeah, just follow me on Strava. That's the only one I really care about. Perfect. We'll link you there, Alex. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. We, we're getting into into this this season, right? Yeah, I'm sure you have some German bacon coming up. Oh, absolutely! I'm like, <laughs> well, it, thank it, you, and happy holidays. 